Chris owns an F3 racing team. The next thing you know, he's a major sponsor of the Brisbane Bullet. Every homeowner wants the most amount of money. They want it as quick as possible. REIQ, best agent, three years running, six million a year in gross commission. Probably the biggest thing for me was I embraced video 15 years ago. Just go home. Are you too good for your home? So we did a spin-off of Married at First Sight. So a groom turns around and I'm presenting him the key, but he's marrying the house. <laughs> oh my God. 100%. We got 120,000 views in four days and we sold for 200 grand over. It's Just so cool. We're young and 18 and making good money. And I blew it all. That's the problem, I think. People see where you are now. Because I want people to understand where you actually start and what it was really like, because a lot of people today are just gonna hear this story and go, six million a year, I'm in, but it's a journey. Why not auctions? I'm, I'm genuinely curious about why that you think it's better the other way around. Look, I can be as brutal as you want because we're here. Be blunt. What is up guys? Today we have an extremely special podcast for you. We have in the studio Chris Gilmore who is the owner of All Properties Group. Now a lot of you have probably never heard of Chris but this guy has won Southeast Queensland uh, or Queensland REIQ best agent three years running six million a year in gross commissions major sponsor of the Brisbane Bullets has his own F3 racing team. It is an incredible interview of an ordinary guy that came from Browns Plains. That's that's where I'm from, which is in the outskirts of Brisbane, to becoming this really successful, low-key, nice dude that's absolutely crushing it. If you've ever thought about uh, life as a real estate agent, you've thought about getting into that business or what it's like to build an actual business outside of just being an agent, you're going to love this, but it's not just for agents. This podcast is for anybody in business who is looking to create an edge. Chris unpacks how creativity, authenticity, and just being different in a business is the key to unlocking growth where others just don't see opportunity and learn about how he innovated, how he grew, and it's just a great interview. So guys, make sure you watch to the end. Right to the end, there is stuff that made all of us on the pod here sit and go, oh my God, that is mind blowing and it's in the last five minutes. The last thing I wanna say before we actually get into this pod is drop a comment below and subscribe to the channel because we will be picking out one person randomly from the comments below this video and we're gonna give away a free iPad. There's only two things you gotta do. You gotta have a comment below and you gotta be subscribed to the channel and we're gonna draw a winner in an upcoming episode. We're gonna come back to this episode. We're gonna look at the comments. We're gonna randomly pick one and as long as you're subscribed as well, you're gonna win the iPad. So all you need to do, hit that subscribe button, drop a comment, and let's get into it. Bye for now. What is up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of Unemployable, Australia's fastest growing podcast, or so we say. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. So good to have you guys back. And thank you for all the amazing comments that you have been leaving in our YouTube channel. We really, really appreciate it. Um, and uh, it really helps our guests know that the content is landing. We have such a good guest today, Chris Gilmore, a local from here in Queensland. I'm just gonna sort of frame this by saying this may be the most unknown, under the radar dude who's just crushing it in the real estate business. After today, more people are gonna know you, which is wonderful. I know that's not what you're here for, but um, if, uh, if you're watching this and you're somebody that likes to fly under the radar, but produce huge results, Chris is going to be a great guest for you. Uh, Mark, how are you doing, buddy? Yeah, pretty good, mate. I'm yep. uh, excited for today's podcast. <laughs> Another fellow real estate Another agent real estate and agent. Um, <laughs> a racing driver and motor car enth yeah. enthusiast. So it's going to be awesome. It is going to be awesome. We're both F1 boys. So for those listening, Chris owns an F3, a Formula 3 racing team, uh, is a major sponsor of the Brisbane Bullets. And all of this has come from starting life as a real estate agent and transitioning to business. I'll give you some headline numbers in a minute, but uh, Eric, how are you, buddy? What's going on? Very, very, very good, mate. Um, glad to have Chris on. We've known each other for a fair few years. And uh, yeah, I've seen his journey. We met on a it was a cruise, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a cruise. You got to be careful what kind of cruises. There's a lot of different cruises out there. So, it was actually a P and O family cruise. It, it was. Yeah, this it was, was before kids, though. Oh right. It was. Really? Yeah, before kids. So yeah, I've I've seen his journey along the way, and I thought, you know what, you'd be a great guest to come on. Wasn't one of those cruises where you throw your key card in the box. <laughs> it was definitely not one of those. Cruises, <laughs> unfortunately. Where do, you sign up? where do you sign up for those cruises? Oh my god. 
So, uh, guys, you know, this is going to be a great pod. Chris has, uh, you know, started life um, in the same place as me, Browns Plains in the outskirts of Brisbane as a real estate agent. One recently, 21, 22, 23, uh, sales agent of the year in Queensland, uh, best medium-sized agency in Queensland, gross commissions uh, personally of about $6 million a year right now, uh, which is just phenomenal for uh, anybody, let alone uh, being an agent, uh, working hard, obviously, over a lot of time. And there's a lot of stuff we're going to dive into uh, around his business, the All Properties Group, which is going to be exciting to learn the journey from being an agent to being a business owner and still an agent as well. And a, a sports, obviously, you're an Ironman, you're an F3 team owner, um, and I, we definitely want to dive into that and sports sponsorship and so much more. But before we dive into this, um, I just want to, as uh, always, thank our sponsor of the show, Early Bird AI. For those of you watching for the first time and you don't know what Early Bird AI is, this is a company that Eric and I actually uh, funded, uh, two young guys from the Gold Coast who are basically helping businesses around the country and even some overseas to implement AI into their business. No matter what business you are, whether you're a real estate agent, whether you're an e-commerce seller, um, no matter what, you've, if you've got a website and you talk to customers, uh, get a free audit from the guys at Early Bird AI. To do that, you just go to Early Bird, which is E-A-R-L-I rather than Y, bird.ai. So earlybird.ai, the owners, Chris or Sam, will sit down and do a 30-minute free audit with you and show you exactly how you could be using AI, not to fire employees, but to repurpose them into higher and best use. Some of the applications that we've seen are just remarkable. The amount of repetitive work that is being taken away from entrepreneurs, free them up to do creative things, uh, and they do bespoke uh, work as well. So very, very interesting business. Definitely pop over and see the guys there. Uh, it will cost you nothing, and uh, they're terrific people. I'm using it in my e-commerce business. Eric's got it in a few of his businesses now, and uh, they're just really, really good people, and they'll actually do the work for you. They're not selling education, telling you what AI is. They actually do the work, build it for you, for your business custom. So thank you, Early Bird AI. We appreciate you. Um, and today we're going to jump right in because um, I just can't wait to hear this story. It's such an incredible story, starting from Browns Plains, scaling on just the personal agency level to $6 million a year in GCI, gross commission income. Yeah, I think that's, is that the, the way you say it? Yeah. GCI? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, gross commission income. Yep. Gross commission income, something like that. Um, and uh, we've grown from there. But Eric, why don't you give us a little bit of background about your connection um, and how you guys met and, and, and your friendship. Yeah, so um, Chris and I, we met on a cruise, actually. Mm -hmm. I was there with uh, Jen at the time. Um, not my wife yet. We were just not even engaged. That's how long ago. It was, it was about 15, 16 years ago. Uh, started making a little bit of money when I first arrived and thought, you know what, I want to go on a cruise now. <laughs> so we went on a cruise. I think it was, it was uh, where do we go? Ca New Caledonia. New Caledonia, yeah. Vanuatu. Vanuatu. Yeah, just and the Pacific. Yeah, yeah. met uh, Chris and his lovely wife, Rachel, on, on the boat and just kept in contact ever since, to be honest with you. Just, you know, not that we've, um, you know, very, very close friends in regards to, you know, catching up for, you know, we generally um, meet on the beach at Broad Beach. Yeah, right? yeah. We we're meet, staying yeah. in our unit and we're walking along and oh, there's Eric and Jen. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And we just kept in contact and um, it's been good to see, you know, his growth in, in the business over time. And next thing you know, he's an Ironman. And next thing you know, he's, you know, well, he's always been since I know him in, in the F3, you know, car racing. And next thing, next thing you know, he's a major sponsor of the Brisbane Bullets. And I'm like, oh, this guy's doing this all guy's right. Crushing. You know, like, Jesus. So making me look like I'm shit. just blowing a shit ton of money. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. Yeah. So Richard, we might get you to throw up in post um, a, a few photos or video of F3 cars for those who can't picture them. They basically are mini F1 cars. Yeah, right? absolutely. They, 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 they look the same. They're a little smaller, mm -hmm. but uh, it's full on high level racing. And um, maybe maybe we could start because I know there's a lot of people out there that probably thought about getting into real estate at some point or another. Uh, and what I love about your story is that you, you said something when we were having a coffee before we went on camera about uh, you, you didn't want, what was the line? You didn't want to be famous in, in, out there. You just want to be famous with the clients or something? Yeah. So like when you sort of, you see all these agents around Australia and stuff like that, and they've got, you know, everyone ranks everyone and whatever they do in the industry, we sort of fly under the radar. And I always say, I don't need to be famous with my agents. I only need to be famous with my clients. Yes. My clients are the ones that pay us. Yes. 
I yeah. don't care about the other agents. I just their their competition. That, that that's a pretty massive thing. Like so many agents that are getting into the industry. I saw it when I was selling land. They would be all about their Instagram and all about their Facebook page. And it's like, well, how many sales are you doing? Mm. You know, these are the most important metrics that count. There's right? a lot of smoke and mirrors and a lot of fake it until you make it in the industry. And yeah, it's, yeah. I think um, the award should be show us your uh, group certificate. And yes, that's, and that's yeah. There's that's a big, how it should be done. Yeah, that's the real, yeah. the real telltale. Your tax returns and so on. Yeah. So tell us how, what, how did you get into like when you think of agencies, you know, like I remember I started in Browns Plains as well. And for those who don't know what Browns Plains is, Browns Plains is a low socioeconomic mm-hmm. area of Brisbane, especially when Chris and I were coming up back in the day. And I think I might even be older than you. Um, and you know, it was a very, you know, very low socioeconomic area. Um, I, I saw a comedian recently said, if you don't know what, he said, I'm from a low socioeconomic area. If you don't know what low socioeconomic means, you are too. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. <laughs> I was just laughing because I was like, yeah, that's where I was from. Um, but, you know, when you think about these places, I started out selling vacuum cleaners door to door, going Logan, uh, Waterford West, mm-hmm. you know, Brazzle Hill, out Ipswich, you know, all these sort of low socioeconomic areas. That's where I learned to cut my teeth and, my boss used to say to me, you know, this is where you learn to sell. You started selling in Browns Plains. Uh, how did you get into real estate? What drew you to real estate? Who was Chris at that time? Okay, so very similar to you, and you wouldn't know this, but I was selling uh, home security systems door to door. ADT or yeah, something like that? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so we would travel all around Queensland and northern New South Wales, but we would always find, obviously, the low economic or socioeconomic areas. Um, More more crime. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. (laughs) Lots of breaks in, yeah. You know what I mean? But it was door-to-door selling, and um, I made really good money out of that and blew it all at the casino, (laughs) And um, as you do when you're young and 18 and making good money. But um, so I sort of, that's how I sort of transitioned because my dad said, like I said, I want to get into sales. You know, if motor racing doesn't turn out, I've got to fall back on something. And I've always been pretty good at the, you know, talking crap and um so he said look go and do door-to-door and if you can cut it at door-to-door commission only you should be pretty right doing whatever so i did that for a couple of years um commission only made some really good money yep and then i sort of settled down with my wife and went the very normal just go and get a normal nine to five job and i got really sick and tired of just waiting for customers to come in so that's why i got basically into real estate i walked straight across the road because there was a real estate office across the road from where i was working and i basically just walked in and just said i want to you know one i was attracted to the money two i wanted to be paid on the amount of effort or work that i put in you know what i mean and that was the beauty about real estate and then and and that's really just how it came and plus also too i had flexibility to still go and motor race was this with in Browns Plains? Yeah. And what agency was it? Harcourts at Browns Plains. Harcourts, Browns Plains. You just walk in the door. Yep. How old were you? Uh, so I was 20, 26, and I still remember the interview. He said, why should I employ you? And I reached over, grabbed the pen out of his pocket, and then grabbed a uh, piece of paper, and I just wrote a dollar symbol. I said, that's why. Yeah. Because I'll make you a shit ton of money. Is that right? Yeah. And, and what did he say to that? Um, well, it's pretty easy to get into real estate. I think if you've got a heartbeat, you're, you're employed. Yeah. Um, that's what we sort of say. But um, like when I, when I got into it, I didn't know real estate at all. Uh, I was getting paid 20% of the commission. The boss was taking 80%, which is just ridiculous. Jeez. Like I was getting absolutely stung. Yeah, wow. Um, so which like, you know what that is. Usually and it's the other way around. Yeah, absolutely. It is now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but back in the day, I was on 20% of the commission. I was doing all the work. And then after eight months, I turned to the number one sales agent who was my business partner now and just said, look, if you're ever opening a, an office, I'm coming with you. The very next day, he came with a spreadsheet. He said, this is what it's going to cost to buy in. And eight months after being in real estate, we opened our own office. Wow. That's, gold. And that's, that's incredible. That's how it came up. So before we get into the growth of our All Properties Group and this incredible story, Let's talk a little bit about what that was like. Day one, you're a real estate agent on 20% of the commission in Browns Plains. What did you do the next day? Like, what, what, what was the journey? What was the reality? Because I want people to understand where you actually start and what it was really like, because a lot of people today are just going to hear this story and go, six million a year, I'm in. But it's a journey. 
Yeah, like, and, and that's the problem, I think. People see where you are now, like mm-hmm. yourself, you know, like they wouldn't have seen you back in the days in the dorm doing what you were doing overseas and yeah. like no one sees. So like I, like in real estate, you do a lot of door knocking, cold calling, letterbox dropping. So I would be up at four o'clock in the morning. I brought a posty bike. Uh, I used to run um, and then I got a little bit busier. So then I'd go on a push bike to speed it up because this is how, you know, you'd get your business then I got a posty bike, so I got my motorbike license, brought a posty bike, dressed up like a posty so I wouldn't get uh, caught. And um, Seriously? That, yeah, that, absolutely. That is unbelievable. Yeah. I, like, love, I, I love these stories. Absolutely. So you're dressed up as a posty yeah, so in Brown's flames. Posty. So people would come out and I wasn't the posty. I was Chris from or Property Scroop and that's how I'd meet people. Is that in my, right? In my area. I used to drop flyers for Herbalife. I was selling Herbalife, yeah. lose weight, You've now ask everything. me how. Mate, I've done everything. But I used to go around and drop flyers and lose weight, now ask me how yeah. when my day job finished in Brown's Plains to try and get customers to buy my weight loss stuff. Yeah. Dressed as a basil. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ray, you're on this posty bike yeah, so and you're dropping these flyers to say, hey, would you like your yeah, house value yeah, so or something? I, yeah, absolutely. So we'd do a newsletter. I was very entrenched in, in the community. So I picked a core cool little area, not in Brown's Plains, but close yeah. to Brown's Plains and yeah. brought it up to, it was Druval, so it was Brisbane City Council, mm-hmm. uh, a little bit more expensive for real estate as well too. And I lived there as well too. So people knew where I'd lived, that they would see me walking, they'd see me out and about in the community every single day. Impersonated government officials. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like they're allowed to ride along the driveways and the grass. So if I dressed up like one in the high vis and, you know, I had the bags on the side and shit like that, like I wouldn't get caught and cops wouldn't look at you or anything like that. So I did that and I did that for about eight years. I was letterbox dropping still after eight years. Wow. I would still do it myself because I knew it was going to be done right. It was consistent. I know the days that there was no junk mail going into that area as well. So I, whenever I did it, it would be by itself. Um, and people would come out. They would see you. They would talk to you. And that's just sort of really how it started. So, Do, do you remember your close rates from back then? How many houses you need to drop to get a listing? Uh, no, but like it was I, – I worked in a very small area. But yeah. I, I, I saw a, a market where no one really picked the suburb where I was living. It yeah. was sort of like the forgotten suburb. But when I looked at the numbers, there was 80 sales a year. So I'm like, if I can get 60 of those, like you, you, you're making very good money out mm. of that. And then, so I got to a point where I think I was running at around 83% market share. Well, eight, 83. Yeah. For the suburb. yeah. So, so talk about those early years, right? Because this is the thing we sat down with, we sit down with entrepreneurs every week here and we hear the headline number, they're doing 20 million a year in sales or 170 million a year in sales. Yeah. When we had Grant in here a week ago with, um, a couple of weeks ago with, with Nutrition Warehouse, he started in the yeah. outskirts of Brisbane, right? Yep. I said, tell us about the first store. And then where were you at the end of one year? Where were you at the end of two? About two years, only had three stores. Today he's got 111 stores. So with your journey, you're one year in, two years in, what were the early days like from an income p- perspective compared to where you are now? Where did you start? Yeah, so like first year, it was, I think I did, my first year was about 110,000. Right. Uh, I said, I want to make six figures. Um, and we did that. And then it sort of, I sort of then, I'm a control freak, probably like the majority of you guys and most entrepreneurs are. Uh, we like to control everything that we can. But I sort of felt like if I'd let that go fairly early and I grew a team, then the income should grow. Um, and then I think from there, I think we went from about 110 to, uh, I think it was about 350, 400K. And then I think about my third year, fourth year into real estate, I was doing a million plus. And how many years ago was this? 16, two, 2007 we started. So 2007. A million dollars. So your first million would be in 2007 or? No, no, yeah. no, no. That was 110. That was, yeah, yeah, so that was what, 2010, 10. 2011? Yeah, probably. It was, yeah, like when the GFC hit. Yeah, 08, yeah. 09. Yeah, yep. so we were, we were a couple of years after when the real estate went just completely terrible. I mean, that's, that's incredible by today's standards, honestly. But back then, that's real money. Mm. You know, there's yep. twice as much money in circulation now as then yep. uh, from an inflation point of view, more than twice. So, yep. um, so you really did hit the ground running pretty, pretty hard. I mean, 110 grand in today's world, first year in real estate is incredible. But back then, that's amazing. Yeah, but like I think I had that mindset because when I was doing the door-to-door and I was, I was, I was making a couple of hundred grand doing, when I was 18, right doing door to door and i blew it all and i always said my next job i'm going to put 100 percent in 
I'm like, I'm, I'm not going to screw this up. You know what I mean? And, and because I didn't really try, you know, we'd work four hours a day and then I'd be at the casino. Yeah. Right. Like when you're 18, like no bills, no, no responsibilities, nothing. And there was nothing to do. And we we're always traveling. So I was like, where's the local pokies, pub, whatever you, you know. What were, you, what were you doing training personal development-wise? Because I remember, was it ADT that you were with? Yeah. So what was the name of the fellow? He ended up going to prison, the guy that ran that joint, from memory. Um, he was quite a high-profile dude. I think if it's the same, same company. I wonder if he um, got caught with his own camera. <laughs> no, 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 no. I remember this story. But anyway, I, might, I don't want to defame the guy if that's the wrong guy, but I, you know, I'm not sure. But, but no, but, but only because I can't remember what happened. It was unrelated to that. It was something else. But were you doing training and stuff like then? Were you reading books? Were you one of these Tony no. Robbins people? You were no, just like... None of that. Gift of the gab. Just nah, just on. hard work, man. Just I think anything in sales is relationships and just being relatable. Yeah, right. That yeah. was pretty simple for me. Yeah, but I remember meeting you on, on the cruise and, you know, very personable, you know, and, and that's what it's about, right? It's like you, you have that personality, that outgoing personality where you can go up to anyone, shake their hand, say hello, yeah. you know, have that elevator pitch type of, you know, personality. And yeah, yeah um, I think it was a mentor that I had once said that um, good salespeople or, or good selling is just a transfer of enthusiasm. Yeah, energy. So you're there, so you're running around, you're doing the posty bike, you've started off, you're cranking pretty early in business. Um, what was the early stages of like transitioning from being an agent? So you were eight months as an agent and then you you bought 20% into the agency, Yep. correct? Yep. And then what was the transition like from going from an agent to being a owner were you still primarily selling as well or always always, always been selling? a selling agent even always. today yeah so you know i have a ceo i have everyone else around me and i think that's as i've grown i've had really good people beside me hmm. you know what i mean because i know what my skill set is my skill set is getting into that home listing and selling there's more money in that than being the business yeah. owner to be honest as well you're too. not going to make it, six million dollars being the ceo oh hell no <laughs> no, no. You, the, the i don't best, pay my ceo anywhere <laughs> near that the best real estate agencies have obviously a great rent roll mm -hmm. and the principal is doing a lot of the selling or the listing at yeah. least yeah. yeah so it was yeah it was i don't know that's just that was the journey. It was just so, for, so, but I don't really run the business right at all. So you got. I think you said you have a team of ten around you. My personal team is ten. Ten yeah. people to help you facilitate that level yeah. of sales. So six million in GCI. How many transactions is that roughly? Two hundred and fifty odd a Two, year. Yeah. So that's a lot of paperwork and a lot of administration, right? To yeah. if you're selling two hundred and fifty arms, because that's a home nearly every day like it's it, it's yeah well, take every, out some weekends and take out some weekends and you're there there's really you got to double that because in real estate selling established real estate you got to make two sales the listing and then the actual sales so. yeah but like then also too you've got to get into the door you yeah. know and you don't get you know you've got to get into four or five hundred homes to to be able to list you know 70 percent of them and then of the 70 percent that you list do you what do you sell 80 percent of them you know mm. what i mean it's all numbers yeah. it's purely numbers game how did you get a listing back in the day? So you, you talked to somebody, was it the old strategy of, hey, would you like to have a chat about what your home's worth or this is what's happening? What sort no. of stuff were you doing? So my, I, because I did the door knocking, I, I said I'll never door knock again, even in real estate. Like the amount of naked old ladies I've seen in my years, <laughs> I am like, I'm not doing that ever again. I kid you not, man. Naked old ladies don't sell houses? Yeah, yeah, but like, I don't... <laughs> Majority of them were in Mackay for some reason. I don't know why, but anyway. Um, but I always said I wanted a, an attraction agency where they call me. Okay. Right. So I've never cold called and I've never door knocked. Okay. So I've just made sure that, which you being in real estate, it's probably kind of weird. It's very backwards. So I would always do the opposite of everyone else, but I always made sure that my brand was clean. My content was clean. You know, this was even before social media mm. and online and it was all, you know, print media. So I made our brand look attractive that they would want to work with us. And I've always had that. So I've always had that attraction agency or that attraction name that they'll just call. Can you give us an example of how we might experience your brand in the real world that, does, that defines what you've just explained? Yeah. So what do you mean it's clean and uh, it's an attraction agency? Like how would that show up in the real world? Uh, I think just around our brand is very, 
um, consistent. Right. Right. Our message is very consistent. Like if, if you go to Logan and you you would see our brand everywhere. So I've got like seven billboards on main roads. We've got buses, 70 bus stops. Like everywhere you'd look, you, you see us. But it's the same look. It's the same, same photo, same image, everything like that. But we were always known for just getting amazing results because I never did auctions. So I was always against the grain of everyone else. Everyone would promote auctions. I'm anti-auction. Mm. And um, I was always known as, and that's why I've got the tagline, Australia's fastest agent, only because of the racing. But we would always sell homes very quickly, but for amazing money. And that's very simple in this, you know, to, to get that sort of branding that they want to deal with someone that's going to be no fuss, no bullshit, straight to the point and get the job done. Especially and, in those areas, right? Absolutely. That's the nature of people there. And did you promote that success within your branding? Everything. Or that everything style? was, even on our signboard, sold in 48 hours, yep. sold in six yep. days. Everything had Time. a number to it. That's right? the inbound hook. Absolutely. It was always that. I don't do it now because we call that ego marketing. It's not info marketing. Um, but when I first started, I had to... Um, and I also, probably the biggest thing for me was I embraced video 15 years ago. I was probably one of the first to do videos. Mm. And we would always just do outlandish videos to basically just so like, look at me, look at me sort of thing. Like we're just... I've always been against the grain. What's an example of an outlandish video? <laughs> um, Did you recruit some of these old ladies? Be honest, Chris. No, nah, no, nah, <laughs> not, nah. <laughs> not at all. Um, okay, so like we back in the day, I would be uh, in the back of a ute in a chicken suit. Um, <laughs> okay. I would be driving a car in a gorilla suit and then walking through a home. I would have, uh, I would have an owner spraying me with their hose while I'm talking about the house at the front of the, like just stupid shit. I look back at it. It's all on my YouTube. Like all the videos are there. There's one there's over a thousand one of my favorite, there. one of my favorite ones, right. was you walking into the house straight in through the house and at, at the back, the house had a pool and <clears throat> he used some animation or whatever it was. And he's walking through and all of a sudden his tie just goes whoosh. And then his shirt just goes whoosh. And then his pants just go whoosh. And all of a sudden, by the time that all happens, he's at the pool and he just goes right into the pool. Like, it was just so cool. I remember that. Just, I like don't know. Yesterday, yeah. It was just, so cool. So those would be on the listing pages of your website, these outrageous videos, just to get attention. Yeah. 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 But that would also be on their flyers, you know. So we used to use QR codes and, and other ways to, before they were cool, you know, before COVID and all that sort of stuff. So we've always just promoted ourselves very big and very large because i had to against all of the other agencies because you've got to understand like you've got the well-known brands where we're a brand new brand mm. you know what i mean so we sort of had to really cut through that noise very quickly so you made people laugh really with some of that marketing as well or Just, was, it, was yeah. that the, what was the Memorable. mindset but behind Attention. Attention. Okay. It was just eyeballs and attention and going, well, no one's even doing pole shots or drone shots or floor plans. So we're, we're coming in doing professional photography, drone, floor plans, video. You know, we're just doing a whole lot more. And then we're saying, well, we're getting these results because of this and we're getting amazing money. Every homeowner wants the most amount of money and they want it as quick as possible. You know? And, and did, were you borrowing those, those things from other industries? Because I remember when I was selling land, I, w I would try and borrow different things that I'd seen in other industries. Like where were you coming up with these ideas to be different? So our uh, content people that we had, they would always, because I was a little bit probably loose in that and, and because we weren't a franchise, I had no boundaries on my brand. I'm like, yeah, like I'm not, I'm not being guided. Like I'm allowed to be on the signboard and I'm allowed to promote my name. And, and that was a big thing why I wanted to start my own was because people list with people. They don't list with companies. Mm. Yes. You know, it's real estate, right? And so it doesn't matter if I was black and white real estate or pink or whatever, they would still list with Chris Gilmore. So well, I think you missed something there. They will list with gorillas and chickens. Absolutely. That, that's, that's what you were promoting yeah. back then, yeah. eh? But I just thought of that. Like, you look at Ray White, you look at Harcourts, you look at these LJ hookers. They would never allow their agents to dress in a gorilla suit and do a video. Not at all. Or do any of those types of videos that you were doing back then. They're, they're so that's a, quite a competitive They're advantage. starting to become a little bit more lenient, but it's only if you're one of the top sellers. Like, mm. there's that Rubens, Rubenstein, and yep. you don't have that leeway until you get to that level. 
you don't you just don't see that much innovation in marketing these days like when we were coming up do you remember kim illman from 1800 one one three hundred or one eight hundred call selling the call numbers yep and there was crazy john you know yeah, john yeah, illman crazy yeah, john the late late john illman and and more recently adrian potelli these guys that have really been innovative in their marketing, like Adrian having his $3 million Aston Martin or whatever it is. McLaren. McLaren, yep. yeah, lifted yeah. into the penthouse. You know, the coverage he got globally from that happening, this $3 million supercar that can't even be registered. But, you know, Kim Illman used to, back in the day with the cricket, he used to have all his guys, he'd buy all the tickets down by the fence line that was in direct line with the camera that used to shoot the, the batsman at each end. So this all day, like, forget the ads, the whole cricket was like 1-800-whatever. Wow, what then, a great idea. And they banned Beautiful. it because of him. But <laughs> but he had like the messages on hold. That's what it was, Kim Elman. He now follows the F1 around as a photographer. Yep. Oh, so yeah. that's Kim Elman. That's okay. That's the Kim Elman. Yeah. So Kim Elman, if you follow him on Instagram, yep. is now a full-time F1 photographer. That's yep. amazing. And a really interesting cat, but he made his money from that messages on hold. So that was him. That's the so same I'll guy. Kim because it's the same dude. Absolutely. I love he's, an, he's a killer marketer. And then after him was John Ilhin. And John was brilliant with his mobile phone company because he like when the block was on it was the big the first series of the block was the biggest tv show it was like married at first sight is yep. now biggest tv show in australia the whole country watched it and he had the brilliant idea of turning up dressed as the company mascot which was the big crazy clown and so when they were doing the auction primetime tv final episode where they auction off the houses crazy john was there dressed up as a clown everyone's like what the hell is this thing and had crazy johns and the cameras couldn't get off him because he was the top bidder so he bought the property and then oh. just flipped it but he had like 15 minutes of prime time non-ad space yep. by dressing up in his company mascot and so the only guy i've Incredible. seen really innovate at that level since has been adrian patelli yep. and he's now a billionaire but i think it's really interesting hearing you talk about that with real estate it's like if i was an agent right now i'd be thinking about okay everything's being done a certain way photo video floor plan what else can you do that is going to get yeah. attention and and i can see why that would have worked yeah so like everyone like we all have the same tools right now but so we've gone another level now so i have a full-time drone pilot in my office and we're, i think we're the only ones in australia but we actually now fly our drones through the home mm. wow. you know just again another point of difference so we're always constantly looking for that point of difference somewhere and it, it's, you, you were what 15 years ago into content like content's a buzzword today but but to be you know at the forefront of content marketing yeah, back like then my youtube been. was 12 13 years ago yeah but yeah, imagine yeah. the attention right you'll get attention now being in a gorilla suit or a chicken suit selling a home he yeah. did it 13 14 15 years ago that's why you know when i was following him and his journey and seeing this stuff that's what intrigued me i'm mm -hmm. like this guy's doing some cool stuff you know and and that's where i kept just following chris and you know, creating that relationship over time because I'm like, this guy, this guy's thinking outside the box and he doesn't give a shit about what anybody thinks. Yeah. And if, if anyone at home is listening and, and has an e-commerce business and thinking, how is this relevant or transferable to them? It, it really is. I was um, speaking to my ads manager for, for Meta and he's explaining how to go about, you know, winning on, on Facebook ads. And I said, oh, great. So once we solve the puzzle, what stops people from, you know, scaling this to 100 million? And he basically said content. He said at some point the content will stop working or someone else will come out with better content. So you really have to be, always be ahead of your game in creating content. Well, you look at High Smile again. I always mention High Smile, but those guys are so innovative around a few simple products, toothpaste, toothpaste tooth whitening, but their ads are always varied. They got dressed up as, you know, in banana suits and like they're a billion dollar a year revenue in business. But yep. their ads are like super accessible, but constantly changing. It's like a, a you know, creative is where you win. Yeah, and even the pop-up stores they make, proper pop-up stores yeah. in the middle of Sydney CBD. You know, they have a pop-up store for three days, mm -hmm. and just lineups. You know, they did one where they were doing tattoos, teeth tattoos. You know, yeah. So well, they had all these kids lining up to get a, you know, a, 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 a tattoo kind of thing. You know, on their tooth. You know, like innovation is unbelievable. Where, is where Something it's you wouldn't at. think about. What I'm interested to hear, Chris, it looks like you were going to say something there. No, I was, I was going to say, I think the problem for real estate agents in that space is because of the corporate brands. They're right. restricted. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. They're very controlled. And I love it. That's your competitive advantage, uh, right? You know that's, that? that's why we started our own and, and, and 
and our agents have just free run to be maybe, as creative as they want. Maybe I should take that with uh, with Sutherland Group, the off the plan. We, we have a real estate business that does off the plan and we're not governed by any corporate, you know, as well, whereas most of our competitors you, you are. Really, you really should encourage it. Like I, I used to work for Stockland and I've, I've got friends that work in, you know, the main brand real estate agencies and they weren't even allowed to have a Facebook account or an Instagram. And that's how I started selling a lot of land is I just put myself out there when no one was doing it in real estate, started recording videos. But it was my, it was my boss, Nigel Satterley, like he, it's a private company, he owns it. He was encouraging me to go out there and do that like, like I think you probably like do. I encourage stuff. everyone to go to these franchise groups. Keep yeah. doing. <laughs> yeah. cut, cut all that you that know. we just do. I suppose. Yeah, you go you to know. the franchise groups because it leaves more to you with the innovators. Absolutely. Well. And plus they're, they're losing 10% off the top as well too. Yeah. It's on yeah. 10% in front of them. Yeah. Let me ask you, I'm interested about your anti-auction, right? Like um, why is that? Give me, because I've, I've been pitched with all, every property I've sold recently have been auction processes. Um, so steel man the other side of that argument. Why why not auctions? I'm I'm genuinely curious about why that you think it's better the other way around. How long do we have? No, go for it. I mean, yeah, everybody I here, so... most people here listening to this podcast, I can tell you right now, when they're getting pitched, a vast majority of... Pro it's Absolutely. true, right? A vast majority are going to be pitched on going to auction. Yeah. Maybe you could, from your perspective, say, why is that? Why do most agencies say go to auction? And why do you believe that it's not the best way? Like, I can be as brutal as you want because we're here. Be blunt. Okay, absolutely. Yeah. So... The franchise groups promote auction because it's on the market longer because it's a four-week campaign, so they get more exposure around the agent and the brand. Mm -hmm. Okay, They believe they're going to meet more people, which they'll actually meet less. Um, so it's more around a branding thing for, for the companies. Okay, um, They will say that it's going to produce the best buyer and all of this sort of stuff. When you have a look at the statistics, more homes sell private treaty than they do auction because... Uh, an auction you've got to be a cash unconditional no conditions sort of buy which takes out like 67 percent of your market so are you attracting 100 percent of the market when you take a property to the market no you're not plus it's a four-week campaign for something that may not get a result your home's on the market longer other properties are going to come to the market on week one week two week three and if that's easier for that buyer to buy then they're just going to jump on and buy that other property so there's multiple reasons why I choose not to. Probably, again, against the grain, everyone pushes auction, so I'm going to go, look, I'm anti-auction. I, I actually have another system which creates more competition, more offers, higher price, and with an auction, you've got a reserve. So the seller has to sign a reserve price, so that's your number. Now, if you've got two buyers bidding for that property and you stop and you're a dollar more and you're above reserve, you're sold. But you still could have had another 100K in your pocket, but because you stopped, he doesn't have to spend it. So I personally don't believe it's the best way to produce. You don't think price. it's market, like when markets are red hot, it's better to auction? It's, you, well, there's you, other ways. Like even under private treaty, you can still do multiple offers. You right. know, like there was a property, we did it last night. Like a tender. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, but even with the price on it. Mm. So like one of our properties we did last week, we had 42 offers. Wow. You're not going to get that at yeah. auction. I, I, see, I'm, I'm from Canada, Canada, sorry, originally. And there's no such thing as auctions in Canada, you know? Like even US, it's not a big thing. No. It was only when I came to Australia and even telling my friends and family back home and stuff, oh, auction off. Like, what do you mean? Like, it's like proper, like a, like I, a I, yeah. car, car auction? I'm like, yeah, it's exactly what it is, except you're buying houses, you know? And, yeah. and a lot of agents are scared to say a price because they don't want to lose the listing. So we have this, this term in real estate called buying the listing. Who, so who tells the biggest lie will win the listing? Mm. You know, so I've never... Yeah, and again, that's probably why we're attracted to to sellers. Like, we're no bullshit, cut straight through it. This is the best way. And like, every home's going to be different. Like, I've still taken properties to auction, but different markets, different demographics, yeah. different homes, different areas. It's not. But like, these agents just go, "That's the way I have to do it," and they go in and pitch a hundred percent of the time the same thing. Which it's, I want to. It sounds like you know your target market real well, right? Like if you niched it in, you know exactly what they want. You stick in those areas. It like works. We, yeah, like we were talking about this outside. I'm like, when are you coming to the Gold Coast? You know, he's like, I'm on the Gold Coast. I'm in Pimpama, and I'm like, I don't think of Pimpama as the Gold Coast, but really, it we is call a part it Upper Logan. The, yeah, but really, it is a part of the Gold Coast, right? I'm thinking like, why aren't you in Broad Beach? Why aren't you in Surfers? Why aren't you in Mermaid? Right? And I love what you said outside. Yeah. 
it's it's so cool. What did he say? What did you say? It's all happening. Well, can we say it on air? <laughs> no, no. I think it was basically just because we're, we're you know coming, you've got but yeah. We want we want to do it with the right people. Yeah, yeah. So and, and also that you know there's there's so many agents trying to sell one property. You know mm. they're all fighting over that one property. That one you the know multi million everyone, wants, ten, everyone yeah wants that ten million dollar property Beach because front. you know if Chris's average sale is seven hundred he's got to go and sell you know. 12 13 properties for every one as an example but there's only so many 10 million dollar properties to sell and there's so many other agents that are chasing that 10 million dollar property yeah i mean if if anyone's thinking about getting into real estate i think you said it at the very start there was you you looked into a suburb there was 80 sales there wasn't really a main agent in that in that suburb it really is supply and demand with with that as well just research and knowing your numbers because that's all real estate is and everyone watches these real estate millionaire tv shows and they want to sell the glamorous property but that is really the most competitive part of the market because everyone's trying to sell in those areas i I, I get so frustrated because you know me owning a real estate uh, business totally totally different to be honest with you off the plan versus versus second hand but i i i tell the agents that i'm blue in the face now, I haven't been a real estate agent myself, right? So I'm a little bit different on, on what I say and how I say it because I can't say it from me actually doing it. But I'm like, you know, ring the database, make the calls, you know, he or she who makes the most calls, you know, will get the most sales. Like there's, it's a numbers game. It's exactly what you said, right? They're not just going to fall on your lap. You know, you got to do the work. And that's the reality. You know, you've done the work and it's just compounded, we're still compounded doing the and work. compounded over mm. time. Yeah. We have three full-time people that call all day. Like we're probably doing 150 to 200 connects a day. I have three of them full-time. What's the conversation? Just, hey, it's, you know, Chris Gilmore's office. We just call him to say, hey, just to let you know with recent sales or how's the dialogue? Yeah, so it depends on the type of call and what we're calling for. Mm. Um, I don't go for the throat where a lot of people are trained. Hey, Adam, it's Chris from All Properties Group. Have you, you know, if you could get an amazing price for your property, would you consider selling? Mm. Like, man, I'm, I'm at Woolworths right now. I'm dropping off the kids. Like, no. Like, yeah. you know. So ours is just very more conversational sort of base just to build that relationship because I don't know anyone that has rang someone at that particular time and gone, you know what? I've been sitting on my couch waiting for someone to call me today to, yeah. to come and sell my home. <laughs> so ours is just more like if we're ringing around a property, it would be, Hey, Adam, it's Chris from All Properties Group. You probably would have noticed we've just listed, you know, one Smith Street down the road. What we're doing is we're building our marketing campaign for our buyers and we're just asking all the owners that live in the street, what is the best thing about living here in Southport? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And you have a 10-minute conversation. Hey, Adam, when, when we sell the property, do you want me to just let you know what it sells for? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Chris. And then, bang, follow that up when you sell it. And that's just how we start that relationship. Yeah. Not yeah. selling a thing. That's great. I get a couple of young guys calling me on the Gold Coast because I've sold some property in Burley, uh, some commercial properties, mm. and, I, and I have a real empathy for them when they call me because I know that they've probably just joined the office, they've been yeah. given the database and they're yeah. calling through, and I always make a point to be really nice to them, but also because I know how hard it is to get good property as a buyer, uh, in, I buy commercial, so yeah. I always say, hey, thanks for calling me, I really appreciate it. Not in the market right now, but, you know, could you, I know I'm probably a minority of calls. It actually makes them feel good. And I say, keep up the good work, mate. Like, this is how you build a business. Yeah, well done. Good. And I give them the encouragement. But um, you, you're so right that it, it, this needs to be a conversation. I was going to ask you, because there's a lot of people listening to this who don't self-identify as salespeople because they mm-hmm. think, okay, if I'm going to be a car salesman or I'm going to be a real estate salesman or woman, um, I have to be a certain way. But actually, many of the best are just normal people that can hold it authentic right that's is that the case 100 percent because your vibe attracts your tribe right so like i'm probably within my competition i'm probably the most hated real estate agent in queensland (laughs) right but that's like when you're at the top you're going to be the most hated my clients love me that's all i care about Mm. but there will be clients there that we just don't connect with and that's cool you know what i mean like it's i want to work with people that want to work with me i got that luxury where i can sort of choose as well too but I think so many people fake it, especially in real estate. You're yeah. meant to have the Mercedes and the BMW and the suit, and the pocket tie, and you know all of that sort of stuff. It's like sometimes I rock up like this. Yeah, yeah. Like it's just this is me. Yes. You know, I, th- I think that's important. I mean, obviously, anyone who gets into sales is is 
loves making money, but if you approach the sales conversation with dollar signs in your eyes, the other person is going to see that. And I've, I've seen some of the best salespeople, men and women that I've seen, they're just the best conversationalists. Yeah. And they just, you can tell that they want to help at a level beyond what anyone else wants to help at. And the customer feels that. The person on the other end feels that yeah. and wants to buy from them. You buy off people you like, you don't buy off people Absolutely. you hate. Yeah. But real estate, I, I believe, is one of the easiest. It's the hardest game in the world, but also one of the easiest games in the world. Because it's so emotive. Just a high energy. Yeah. Walk in there, have a listen to what the client wants. This is any sales, yes. no matter what you're selling. Like, that, that's just sales. People have got to connect with you and Absolutely. feel real. Like, I used to smash it with Kirby vacuum cleaners because I had dust allergies. I still have dust allergies <laughs> these days. So I'd go in there and start my demo, and about halfway through, I'm just completely allergic to their house. Yeah. And they're like, we've got to pie up this poor bastard. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so I'd sit there with my big buck teeth and my bad haircut and trying to sell them this <laughs> vacuum cleaner. But I'd say, oh, sorry, no, it's my allergies. It's not your house. And then they feel, you know, it's just that empathy and that building of a relationship. And, and uh, you know, real estate agents, the irony I've always thought is that the guys and girls with the real money on the Gold Coast, for example, came up through a different era. And sometimes you see these real estate agents from Broadbeach, you know who you are, <laughs> rock up with their pants that are like two sizes too small, their suit jacket that barely buttons up. You see them pull up at the coffee shop, park in the loading zone while they go get their latte, <laughs> latte macchiato bullshit. And everybody's sitting around going, what a fuckwit. And on his number plate is, you know, listed or whatever the fuck they put on that, that adam that that was me my, my number plate is um is personalized <laughs> yeah I, I, but you know but then there's other agents like you like and i've got some mates who are agents here that are under the radar that make 10 times as much and they turn up respectfully well dressed but not like a wanker and have a real conversation with you and you t tend to find that these these guys that are just making bank that are just um, never forget who they're dealing with. Yeah, like we've got to understand, like for, for real estate, it might seem glamorous, but like, you know, there's suicides, there's murders, um, you know, we've got drug dealers, you know, we've got people that are bankrupt, divorcing, like we see it. I, I have seen it all, you know what I mean? I could write a book on what we've seen and, and the clients that we've dealt with. So people just want to go from one place to another and we're just that person that allows them to do that and try and do it as quick as possible and as seamless as possible. Mm. It's, it's sales 101. So, so how do you manage real estate, Chris, $6 million in GCI versus entrepreneurial business owner, Chris? How do you balance, how do you balance that? Have a good team, good people around you. Um, I listen to a lot and watch a lot. Uh, when well, with what I consume but there's a fine line as well too being that business owner I think it comes back you're only as good as your staff as well too because they're the ones that are out you know representing your brand as well too so I get asked that question a lot especially around time like we will only have 24 hours in a in a day and we seem to pack so so much more like I have people walk in and they oh I'm so busy and I'm like man you don't know what busy is you know what I mean but it's just how you allocate your time and stuff so I think I've been very lucky with who I've grown up with the advice I've, I've listened to at a very young age as well too um, they've all said I wish I was young you know when we, I, I have 18 year olds come into the business I'm like man you've either got time or money mm. and I'd rather the time not the money mm. you know now that we're much older and um, so you sort of try and pass on that advice as well too. Like you can just like cream it now as well too. Can you describe like a young person that's joined your business that you're really proud of, like their journey into real estate and, and how you mentored them and what their journey has been just for young people listening that might want to join your team? Yeah, so like we, we've got a couple, like uh, we've got one fella, he was uh, NRL, so with the Storm. So he's, um, he obviously didn't make it because of some player called Cam Smith that you might have heard about. So he was both fighting for the same position. Came in to us. He did, um, and, and this is the problem with real estate. They see all this money very quickly, but they don't see the 17 years that we put in. They just see it now. And I said, look, just follow and watch what we do. Listen to what we do. Do your apprenticeship like a builder or a sparky plumber. You know, do good three, four years and then just take off. Um, you know, and so like he's came in, he listened to that advice, does everything. I actually think he's better than me at it nowadays, which is great when the student becomes the master and stuff like that. But, um, you know, and, and they're well now doing over a million a year. Like just, it just sets their family up. And like, that's kind of cool when you're like, you, you see him come in and they're, 
you know they're earning 50 60 80 k a year in a job and you know like now they're on seven figures it's kind of cool in commission yeah yeah he's making more than an nrl player now yeah and how, how long yeah, has like he been we in make, the game? We make more than the PM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it's crazy what they yeah. do and what we do. And how, how long has he been in the game? Six years. Yeah, yeah. One of my best mates is, a, is one of the top agents here on the Gold Coast commercial, yep. and he's mentored his son into the business. And his son's similar story. He's in his, I think, mid-20s, but yep. just a super respectful, dresses really well, but not like a wanker, you know, <laughs> just conducts himself well, you know what I mean? Like, and he's, I think, getting around that sort of money yeah. as well in his mid to late 20s yeah, but mid 20s wait give him another 15 years oh in the game God. It's, it's he'll be making like you're making you know yeah. and it's and it's that's what i i really encourage i, I love these stories because I, I for young people listening i don't know real estate but i know business and what i know is you've got to find the right mentor that vibes with you and if you're one of those people that is not afraid of hard work and and is not afraid of putting your ego in your back pocket and just listening to someone like chris you could do a lot worse than joining your organisation and being mentored by somebody who's not a dickhead and has gone on to own F3 teams, sponsoring the, the bullets and had fun with it as well. Because like, sometimes you see agents, and I, I, I won't name names, but there are some that are just full on. Like, And I can see they're not, they don't have a life outside of real estate. When they're not talking about real estate, they're talking about real estate. <laughs> you know? yeah. uh, you've got sort of a family You've got a life, you're healthy, you, you train Ironmans, you still do your passion. I want to talk about F3 in a minute because yeah, we're both mad F1 fans. But I think for everyone listening, if you want to get into real estate, finding the right mentor uh, who's by looking down the road, Mark talks about this a lot, looking down the road at the life they're living. Do you want to live that life in all aspects, not just the gross commission income, but how they roll, yeah. how they live? Yeah, and and if if there's people out there that are kind of don't want to do a nine to five, but yet don't have the capital to get into business or not sure whether they can do, make it in business, real estate for me has been... It, it basically was like running my own business from day one. It I, is your own business. From day one, yes. even though I was employed and I was paid by somebody else, I felt like I was running my Absolutely. own business, had my own autonomy. So it's a, it's a great, great stepping stone for entrepreneurship. I think it's, it's, it's nothing, be, nothing that pays better than sales. Well, yeah, absolutely. Chris, when I asked you how do you manage you know, sales, Chris, and the entrepreneurial Chris, and you said good people, right? What do you mean by good people? Mm. What, what's a good person in, in your world? What's a good person? Yeah, well, you person said good with, people, right? So, okay, you, you, so when, when you're saying good people, I'm assuming your team. Absolutely. And, and how so, do you attract them? How do you attract yeah, them? Okay. And and uh, yeah. what are the skills that they that you look for? Okay, and so, personal relationships as well, because that's super yeah. important in real estate. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Because we spend probably more time with, with these people than I do my own family. Yeah, I, I so, just don't know how hard recruiting is. Yeah. Right, and I mean, so does Adam, so does Mark. Right, it's one it's of the hardest the things. Hardest. Right, so yeah. So how do you attract them, and how do you keep them? Yeah, so well, we, we sort of take on the the All Blacks, um, you know, the the Ethos. analogy. Yeah. yeah, no dickheads, and that, that's that simple, right? So I want A grade players because if you're a C grade player or a B grade, like the A grades don't want to play with the Bs and the Cs, right? So have you know we've got about 75 80 employees right mate i've probably had about 700 people walk through our door you know what i mean wow. and we just like I, I i don't know what the number is but it feels like it's because you gotta i think if you've got to hire and fire very fast because i think people show you with their actions fairly quickly than what their words sort of things so we ascertain if they're probably going to be a really good team player what attributes can they bring I always say stay in your lane so I know what I'm good at and that's why I don't run the business. I just listen and sell. I have other people in my team that are really good with buyers, really good with admin, marketing, video, whatever. So I think it's just you know going through those steps and just finding the right people, who you get along with, who produces amazing work. And then I think those people then just attract other good people as well too. So I think it's all about your frequency and your energy that you put out into that universe. If, if you're manifesting that you're going to have the best people work for you it, it just comes it's just the way the universe works i believe is social media part of your recruiting now like are you absolutely public? so yeah putting stuff out constantly on socials because i've seen some agencies grow up and do really well um out of having a big social profile mm -hmm. um 
So is that part of what you do? As yeah, well? huge. Yeah. yeah. So we, we have a media company, a bit like what you guys do. So I've got about nine in that company and that's really, you know, they're video, web and social content. But is that media including the listings and all that stuff for your business or is it just your social media content? No, so just, oh, so you've got property video in that, okay. but majority, probably 70% of it is going to be more social based. Wow. Yeah, wow. Just social media team. Yeah. Wow. And is that is that all for the brand or are you lending them Both. out to your agents? Yeah, yeah. So all the agents get to obviously use, use it. it. Yeah. So we, I'm not a real estate company. Mm. I, I believe we're a media company. All properties group is a media company. Mm, and it's interesting. Um, basically, the, the house is the byproduct. That's how we make our money. But like, <coughs> if you have a look in our office compared to most offices, so I have two people that enter all the data for, for the agents because... It's an adult daycare center, right? So what can we, we take away? Right? Hopefully they're listening to this. All Especially salespeople. So, absolutely. It's an adult daycare. What do you do? I run an adult daycare center, right? But basically I have everyone, I'm not offshore with anything. Everyone is employed in office. So like I have a drone pilot, I have a web designer, I have four graphic designers, I have um, prospectors, I have buyers agents, I have every single basically person within that business enabling to allow the salespeople to just go and do what they have to do mm. that's awesome if which there... is unseen really like the, what do i invest in staff i have more people employed than i do actually sales agents yeah, yeah that's interesting like that, that that statement that you're a media company that's that's actually for me a really interesting takeaway because a lot of real estate agents would not think that way um, and that's where the world is going, right? Like it's we're all, all media companies. What, y yes, <laughs> we all got to be thinking that way. Yeah. Yes, but a lot of people don't. Yeah, people, it's people the say this is why this is why we're doing with unemployable is we're creating a deeper connection. Like if people are watching this for ninety minutes, it's not the TikTok generation. It's somebody who's watched us for ninety minutes a week, sometimes twice a week, um, and we build that deep level of trust. And like yesterday, we were trying to fill a job. And the guys had to got a job on LinkedIn and on Seek and uh, so, so I went and did a live while we had the meeting with the two boys because we're the investors, Eric and I. I said, what do you need? They said, we need this, 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 and this. So I just went straight to Instagram, did a live. Said, guys, I'm here with the founders of this company. You've watched us from day one. They're on a seven-figure run rate after the first month. They're crushing it. We need somebody who's a fucking beast. And like I could even say that on there because it's my audience. They have not stopped taking applications since mm. we put that post up. That would cost tens of thousands of dollars for recruitment right. to find that person and months of time. Yeah. Proper videos, people sending in proper videos of themselves. Oh, we, we were getting videos arriving in our DMs because I said, send us a video of who you are so we get a feel for you and then your resume to Sam. And like the Instagram, the DMs are just blowing up. But that's earned over media over time, you know, uh, and real following, not going out and buying fake bullshit, but actually real followers, real content. Yep. It's back to that relevance and credibility. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And, and on, the, on the other side of this as well, if you're sitting watching and you're at a crossroads in your career and you're not sure what you want to do next, they, these are the type of, of businesses that you need to find. Like someone who's worked in real estate, that your company is the type of company that I'd be recommending people who want to give it a crack go into. If you've got a little bit of passion. Um, I invested in a young guy years ago out of Melbourne. His name's Rob Sheehan. And Rob started a wheelie bin cleaning business here on the Gold Coast when he was living here. And it didn't work. But we put up the money behind him. It was 15 grand or something to get him started. And it didn't work out. And he said, Adam, what should I do next? And I said, you know what, Rob? You're such a good guy. You should go and learn real estate. Just go and join a, real, a guy like you, right? Um, and he did. He joined an agency down in Melbourne, not one of the big fancy ones, but one where this guy had a great reputation in the area. Yep. And Rob's now crushing it you know years later i'm sure he's making multi seven figures as well just to, I, that's what i love about real estate is if they just put their head down do the work and not be a dickhead for a number of years and build relationships and the other thing i love about real estate is you know in the last four years most real estate in australia has doubled in price so yeah. all you guys have had a pay rise of 100 percent for doing the same job right that's great <laughs> don't tell anyone <laughs> don't tell anyone but so it's true, true right no, like it's true you guys are indexed to inflation you don't wait for a pay rise because houses are going up every year and so is your commission so that's such a good business and if i had a, a a young son or something coming up now that was um at all interested i would say go and join someone like chris yep. and learn sales and who knows you might end up loving it and staying there but at the very least you'll learn to sell you'll learn what hard work is you'll learn about people you'll learn about relationships there's worse places that you could end up. For sure. Um, so what I want to ask you next is, 
F3. Let's talk about motor cars, Let's right? Like you, 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 you're a driver, is that yeah. correct? Yeah, I've been racing since I was five. Okay, so you started out in go-karts. Started in go-karts and then transitioned into Formula Ford and then got into Formula 3 and... So you now own Formula a race 3. team? Yeah, so we've always had our own race team and then... Um, so I was very lucky with, with mum and dad and that we'd travel all around uh, the country and race and... Um, but I lost my dad three years ago. Mm. So we, we had a conversation as a family, Chris, what do you want to do? And I said, look, I don't want to race unless you're there because I've never done a race without dad. Mm. And... Um, we, we got to a point where we sort of wanted to keep that legacy going in his name. And so my brother and I, uh, basically, my brother runs the majority of it. I'm just there for a bit of support and some other stuff. But um, I come back and just do one race a year. So, yeah, sorry so about your dad. Yeah, sorry about that, mate. Tell us about Formula 3. Is it is it is it all over the world? How does yeah, absolutely. You, so, you would have seen it on uh, the Melbourne Grand Prix. So, so you're racing along right beside Red Bull. Yeah, or whoever, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they've got a team in F3, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, okay. I can pick my car up and go and race it in the Euro F1 every, anywhere around the world. Wow. So we're the fastest cars or the fastest category in Australia. Wow. So right. they're good fun. What, is it, what does it cost to run an F3 team each year? Okay, so well, you got to buy the car, you got to buy the truck. Um, so give us some numbers because I'm, I'm, I love this. I, I, I'd love to do something right. like so, team. <laughs> okay, so... For someone, so what we do is basically drivers pay us to race our car. Okay. Okay, so we've won the championship a number of times, so that's always a good thing. They want to be in a championship winning car and, and a team and stuff like that. So generally around 20000 a race meeting. So if you were to come and jump in one of our cars, we'd, we'd be asking for about that sort of money. Twenty grand per race to drive your car. Yep. And what does the car cost to buy? So it depends each year, obviously, if you've got to upgrade your car. In Australia, we're sort of capped at, at the year models that we're allowed to bring into the country, but you can pay 180, 220 for a car, for a new, newish car. And how much do you pay in repairs each month, uh, each year when they're Well, that, that comes up. back to the driver. So mm -hmm. the driver, obviously, so if you were to rip a corner off, it's probably a minimum 10 grand. Your front wing's probably three and a half grand. You got wear and tear on the engine, so the engine's got to go back to Stuttgart in Germany, back to Mercedes at the end of the year, and get completely rebuilt. Um, so in motorsport, right? So we we have this saying in motorsport. So if you want to become a millionaire in in motor racing, start with a billion. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you buy this car for a couple. Of, <laughs> it sounds like how do you make a million that. on the Gold Coast? Start with two. That was the old saying. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? So it's um, but it's again, it's one of these things. And my dad always had. We were always sort of the underdog against all the bigger teams and, and stuff like that. But we were very lucky for the last seven, eight years. We, were, we had backing from McDonald's for the team. So we could bring in a lot of younger drivers that didn't really have the money to, to pay that sort of money with the, with the teams. And you know, so some of our drivers, they're racing in the Lambo series, the Indy Lights series. I've gone over to Europe, um, F2 uh, as well. So it's just bringing all the young fellas in now. Does it net cost you money every year or does it break even or make it's, you money? Like if you break even, you're lucky. Right. Yeah. So it's a break even sort of passion. For the love of the sport. For the love of the sport. But it's not a money maker for you in F3. But does it cost you money every at all or not really? Uh, well, obviously, no, because it's sort of fixed in with the drivers, you know, right. with with what they pay. So I think if, if they break a lot of stuff, then, yeah, it can get expensive. Yeah. But it's um, like... It's just in our blood. We've always done it. It's the only thing I'm good at. Do you go to the races very often? <laughs> no. no. Everyone's like, I had dudes ringing me on the weekend. They're like, well, are, you, are, you, are you in Melbourne? I'm like, man, if I am not racing, I you am nowhere near. Like at the Indy. Like I'd race at Indy. I've raced at the Melbourne Grand Prix. I've raced Bathurst. Like I've done it all. But it, mate, if there's a race meeting on it and I'm not racing, I'm nowhere near did the you, track. Did you, do your kids want to race? No, they had it. Do they? Because yep. I always feel for the parents. I was in Monaco last year when Jack Dewan got hit on the F2 yep. um, and flames and the whole thing. And I was like, oh, fuck, I hope the parents aren't watching because it would just yeah. be Mick terrible. would have been there. Mick would have been there, yeah. yeah. But I, I was watching it and I was just going, oh, my God. Like, I was freaking out because there's a fair bit of fireball there, you know. Mm. Yeah. Did you have any uh, part of it? ever any close calls? Uh, yeah, I've had a few accidents. So probably my worst was Melbourne Grand Prix. So that was in 2000 and. When was that? 2006 or something. So I think we had a field of like, uh, we had Bruno Senna come over from Brazil. So wow. Senna's nephew was racing in it at that, at that particular time. Uh, I think there was about 32 cars on the grid and typical Melbourne style. It, it looked like it was going to rain and, and, and we had to make the call on the grid because we can't change tyres or any pit stops during our races, right? So 
uh, I had to make the call and the call was on me and I said to dad uh, and I was starting I think eighth uh, on the grid uh, for that for the final race and it was coming over black and and I said no nah, no nah, I'll, I'll stick to, to slicks anyway on the warm-up lap it hailed oh no <laughs> so I made it back around to the start but they had pit lane exit uh, entry closed for a pit walk for the celebrities. Oh, no. So we couldn't even enter because my race was over and I knew that. So I was like, I'll pull into the pits, change our tyres and at least just keep the sponsors happy. Couldn't do that. So I had to grid up, had to start, got around, uh, got around to the other side of Albert Park as it loops around and there was a Porsche crash in the race before. And obviously you can't oil. see oil, oil and water. I hit that, spun. I was 180 because I started eighth. I was probably about midfield by that point of time. And uh, I had my mate go through me at about 180k. So I stubbed my leg in half, destroyed the car, oh. uh, wound up in the fence. It was live on TV. My wife was at home watching. Jeez. And it was the first time our category was ever live on TV. It was on for a minute and a half because I ruined it. Oh. Um, and then next minute, I remember having my suit cut off in the medical center because I was out. And um, and then I ended up in Prince Albert Hospital or something. So oh, so man. that's why I do Ironman because they, they said I'll never run again or whatever from that injury. So I'm like, no, nah, screw you. So I went and did 10 Ironmans. So I think that's where the, the, the competitive nature, right? That, that's obviously come from five years old in the go-karts. Is that where it's come yeah, from? Yeah, I'm super competitive. Like I might look like I'm not, but like I'm here to win. Yeah. Like, and I take that like business is a sport to me as well too. It's yeah. just non-contact. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, motor racing or whatever you do, like in real estate, you don't get paid for coming second. If you don't get the listing, you don't get paid. You know, in, in motor racing, you know, I've come second so many damn times and that, that, that could have changed the entire career of, you know, like my first year in Formula 3, I was winning. I, I was winning the championship my first year against all of the big guys. And uh, we're just a little family team. And then I, um, uh, so we were racing the final race at Indy. I was on my fastest lap and it started to rain and um, they could see that the time the track was getting quicker and the team who I had to beat, they put one of their drivers into the wall so they would red flag it so my lap time wouldn't count so they had to take my second lap time and so I had to start further down in the grid because the track was drying because it was wet and then it was because wow. I was on slicks and um so i had to start midfield i'm an amazing starter i'm probably the best starter in Florida. they call me gunstart gilmore so like i can take it from six and be in p1 by um turn one and i got an amazing start and then uh, i clipped someone and then into the wall and my my season was over so i finished yeah. second and then <laughs> so that driver that won that year made it to v8 supercars i didn't uh we then got um invited to go and race for prima uh, over in uh, Europe in the F3 series, but you know you had to take about 2.3 million, so whatever to to get over there. We just didn't have the money, so one of those stories. Got the talent, but not the money. So F1's all about the money, right? Like, it's all money. It's all money. So much of it. I've heard stories of guys turning up and and to race, and the other guys got. I don't know why you're here because my dad's a billionaire or whatever. You've got no chance. Absolutely. You're just gonna. Have yeah. to, have to so I think back in the day, a little bit more was around talent, but today it's it's a business. Yeah, I don't think many people realise that drivers have to pay for their seat. Um, yeah, Kimi Raikkonen did. Yeah. Like they 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 you know it's it's they all did. Did did you ever race any against any household names or famous drivers? Um, so like all the boys in V8 supercars, uh, Ricardo back in go karts back in the day, mm. um, Will Power. Indy, yeah. IndyCar world champion. Yeah. So he's a good mate. Like he's, he's just an incredible driver. So, yeah. Tell us about your tie-up with the Bullets. So you're a major yep. sponsor of the Bullets. Why did you do that? What, love what basketball. You, you love basketball, same as yeah, me. Yeah, so basketball's probably my second sport. So, yeah. you know, I grew up in that era of Jordan and, and all of that sort of stuff. So I've always, I love it. My boys play basketball. They hate motor racing. Um, I'm a mad NBA fan. I love it too. Same. Yeah. Who's your team? What's that? Who's your team? Uh, the Clippers. Yeah, Clippers. So, yeah, really? I lived in LA. Yeah. When I moved to LA, um, it was either Clippers or Lakers, and I, the Clippers were by far the underdog at that yeah. time. And so I was back when Blake Griffin was there and, yeah. and those guys. So I was a huge fan and used to go to games. And But I just think it's an amazing sport. Yeah. Just, I don't have to ask who your team is, mate. And if you're hey, not... To, if hey, you're we've not, won once, all right? That's mate, all, you've that, done, a, you've and done and amazing. I was, and I was in Canada at the time, uh, so I loved it. Good on I was, I was in New York City. I took the boys over and we, went, we right went and saw one game in New York City and it was the Toronto Raptors when they were top of the table yeah. playing uh, the Knicks. 
and we're in Madison Square Garden and it was the bottom of the table Knicks versus top of the table Toronto and I'm sitting there and there's this big uh, African woman next to me and I said hey, what are you doing here and we got chatting we're a lovely lady and she said oh my son is actually playing and I was like oh wow amazing who's your son it was Kyle Lowry who's the playing yeah. for the Raptors yeah, wow. and it was that game like Madison Square Garden New York crowd and it was all night. It did. There was no more than four or five points between them the whole game, top versus the bottom, because the New York crowd was yep. right behind them. And Lowry dropped forty-five points on, wow. on the Knicks that night. But what a night! I was there wow. with Joe and and yeah. uh, Aaron had an amazing, amazing time. The NBA and sport is, I think, if you've got some money, it's a wonderful place to invest. Not only for networking, but just you feel alive. There's nothing like the passion and the competition of sport, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, the bullets just can't win. Yeah. yeah. But do you well, enjoy going to games? Absolutely, and that, that's why we do it. So you know, we, we we sponsor some smaller community partners, but we you know we get 40, 40 odd tickets to every Broncos game. Um, so I use that for my networking. That's where I get mm. to see all of my clients and bring them. And we talk sport. We're not talking business. We do the exact same with the Brisbane Bullets. So in my package, obviously, we get the national branding, uh, which no one really does in real estate on, on that sort of level. So we wanted to be one of the first to do that sort of stuff. What's the um, packaging cost like? Like for entrepreneurs listening to this that might aspire to sponsor a team like that, what are the range of sponsorship opportunities in Australian it, sport? Uh, like for MBL, I'm talking about. It, it depends on what sort of package you want. So, like, when I first started with them, I wasn't on the kit or the uniform or anything like that. Yeah. Um, I was more as a community, getting in with the schools and getting the kids to grow and, and play the sport and stuff like that. So, that wasn't as big of an investment. But once you start being on the kit and jerseys and, and being a um, one of the major partners, it, it can. It's quite a lot. Right. <laughs> I can feel I can feel your butthole yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like <laughs> I can feel the pain. <laughs> I choose to do it. But are we talking are we talking like six figures a year to sponsor it at a high level? Oh yeah. Yeah. Sounds yeah. like more than that. Yeah. So yeah, it's up there. Good yeah. for you. No, it's good. I, I asked because you know I, it's it's interesting and, and it's a it's a fun way to spend money because of the network and the community and being around that competition and you, you watch it in the States, the sports owners over there, and you just see how much, like Steve Ballmer used to be at every game courtside for the yeah. Clippers. And it's just because it's like, it's what brings him alive. You know, yeah. he was at every game for those yeah. reasons, I think. It's he definitely not his hairdo. Yeah, <laughs> so his hairdo. Chris, this has been an awesome interview. Thank you for coming in. Um, is there anything else you guys wanted to, to ask while Chris is here? No, it's been amazing. Yeah. No, it's good. I think... Uh, I think the viewers will get a lot of value out of this. Yeah, something definitely different. And um, uh, what 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 can uh, how how's, can people contact you, Chris? If they want to join your organisation, if they've got that right attitude, how do they reach out to you? How do they follow you online? Yeah, just all the typical socials: Facebook, YouTube, Insta. How do we find you on Insta? Uh, Chris Gilmore. Chris Gilmore. Yeah. G I L M O U R. O U R. O U R. Yeah. yeah. Chris Gilmore on Instagram. Yeah. Or All Properties Group. All properties so, group, yeah. yeah. So follow if you want to get a career in real estate, you've got the right work ethic and long-term approach and someone could be a great mentor for you. And Yeah, I'd love to speak to them. Yeah. 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 So they've yeah. got a bit of energy and enthusiasm. That's all I need. Where so. are your offices right now? Just So uh, Sunshine Coast, North Lakes, two in Logan um, and Northern Gold Coast. Right. So South East Queensland, basically. Yeah. Uh, if you're in South East Queensland and you want a change of life and you want to move to God's country from Melbourne or Sydney or somewhere. They're doing that anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on up and join Chris and the team. Um, you know, honestly, I've been around um, for a while. So is uh, Eric and, and Mark, and I think we all agree. It's, it's great when you meet somebody who's professional in the industry that you can see has actually got a good intention. And, and, um, and you, you know, in that game, it, it really matters. Yeah. What kind of animal suits that they got to fit in this time around? Strictly professional. <laughs> <laughs> so no one's going to be uh, get, uh, your favorite costumes, the Borat outfit. You no, know, naked, with that, with no naked interviews. <laughs> that, <laughs> no, <laughs> depends on sort of views and, and, and stuff. So we're still doing some pretty crazy ones, but we're very um, strategic around what we're doing at the moment. I, I, I just seen one, actually, I showed Adam. I think it was low. Was it Lawani Creek funny. or Lawani? Lawani Pass. With, with you guys. Yeah, the, the, the <laughs> with you guys, with you guys on that <laughs> scooters. <laughs> and you got, you, you got yeah. that hip hop saying, you see me roll. And yeah, roll. absolutely. So um, we don't sell those properties, but it was someone that worked for us and it was their grandparents and they'd been on the market for months and they're the hardest things to ever sell. And I said, look, I'll only do it if we can do a banger of a video. 
and so we got all the oldies and i'm feeding them oranges in the pool and you know with on the scooters and like that that went nuts and, yeah. and we we sold it but like we just done another one uh, it's it's on our instagram you'll see it um mortgage at first sight so we did a spin-off of merit at first sight so i had a groom turns around and he's and i'm presenting him the key but he's marrying the house and then we're the experts and so it was a complete spin-off we got 120,000 views in four days and then we had to sell the media rights overseas. Wow. So, because wow. it went viral. So, so is that something so, sorry, you you're... came up with yep. or is that your team? That's... Yeah, just the team. We sort of, you know, like we, we asked the owners if we got a bit of free run and this is the idea and stuff like that. So like that, that one went nuts and, yeah. and that one we sold um, in four days and we sold for 200 grand over. Adam's when you say dying, you sold yeah. the media rights <laughs> yeah, to yeah. overseas, what, that. What, what, what is that? Yeah, so like if they 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 want the rights to use the video, so you got to sign off the rights to them. So if I now want to use that video and show that video again, I've got to say courtesy of. How of much them. did you get for the rights for that video? I don't even know. I don't. It's not about the money for me. It's more about it just going viral. Wow. So, yeah. So this so is, it this goes is... overseas, and they just they run with it. That's crazy. <laughs> so this is this is the power of creativity, you know, and that's the thing that's just not available off the shelf. You've got to you've got to have that creative approach and willingness to try. But go and see the Instagram because we were literally laughing out loud before you came in at some of your content. Yeah, the Gilmore, uh, the Happy Gilmore one. Was the Happy good. Gilmore one. Get in your hole. <laughs> Did you see number two's coming? Oh. It's a Netflix series. They released it yesterday. Really? I no, kid you not. Wow. Happy Gilmore two is coming. That's yeah, awesome. yeah. But it's like you said before, right? You're a media company. That, that's what this is, yeah, right? That's what eyeballs, these videos mate. are, right? It's eyeballs. It's yeah. eyeballs. There's only a few ways, you know. Some people, they, they've got to have their thing, you know. Like, we're, you know, one of the guys we follow up in Brisbane who's doing, you know, big things in real estate is um, Emil, you know, and he's got his supercars, you know. <laughs> and, and everywhere you go, he's, you see the Lambos and the, he's got, you know, the, every day he's got this stuff. That's his thing. You've got your thing. So you've got to find your thing. And, and, um, and when you find it and it works for you, you've got to double down on it. And, and I think that that type of stuff, if you want to take on the majors, You've got to innovate, and that's what you're doing. So follow the so follow the socials though, because it, it is true mm. creativity. And we were genuinely just laughing. And when was the last time you laughed at a real estate ad or wanted to forward it on? The only guys I've seen, I think, were the unemployables. I think those guys that do the builders, <laughs> but they also do the real estate guys. <laughs> the they do the piss takes on like this is what a real estate description is, and this is what it is in real life. Like it's it's hilarious, yeah. and you see the shares. It's yeah. just so. There's funny. another guy out of Brisbane, Dan something, and he's. He's, he's the one that hits her, um, gets all the personalized plates and he calls it like road to wanker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and like listed, sold, like all this stuff. And he posts them on his Instagram. Another guy dressed it's up in the high vis gear, like writing people tickets for wanker plates. And <laughs> like it's, it's that kind of creativity and you're poking fun, even at your own industry sometimes, that, that is really viral. So it's good stuff. Again, thanks for coming in, mate. Um, follow, pleasure, follow boss. Chris. Yeah, it's been awesome chatting to you, and uh, thanks for coming in and making time for everybody else great. watching this. Drop a comment below, as we say. Uh, let Chris know what you learned from today, and uh, and share the pod with someone that you know that uh, uh, might benefit from this. And we'll see you next time on Unemployable. Thanks for watching. Hey there, I hope you enjoyed that episode of Unemployable. If you'd like to watch another episode, just click there.